Um, good evening, everyone, and apologies for the very slight delay where we were working out the um, very complicated uh, choreography for this evening. Um, so while I'm talking about choreography, I, before anything else, um, I know um, I've got to uh, uh, explain to you where the exits are. Can you take a moment to have a look? Um, where the exits in the marquee are, in the very, very unlikely event of needing to use those exits, members of staff, of the Charleston staff, will guide you to the ne your nearest exit, but it would be a good idea if you took a moment just to have a look around the marquee, just to have an idea where it might be. In 24 years, this has never happened. So, <laughs> but... It's, it, but, it, but it is as well, it is as well, um, it, it, it certainly is well to be uh, aware of that. And we're going to be saying that at every event, so um, you'll, you'll know it off by heart. Right, so now it is um, my pleasure to say good evening again and to say how delighted I am to welcome you and tonight's speakers this evening. Um, next to me, the renowned actress, Juliet Stevenson, uh, next to Juliet Paula Byrne, who's going to be talking about Jane Austen. Uh, next to Paula, Lorna Gibb, who will be talking about Rebecca West. And at the far end, Andrew Wilson on Sylvia Plath. And as you, some of you will already know, this is the climax of the first day um, of this year's Charleston Festival. And it's called Rooms of Their Own. Now, this event is an embarrassment of riches. And of course, it's a tribute to Virginia Woolf, who's intimately associated with Charleston. Now, we know that Woolf greatly admired Jane Austen, whose gifts she considered to be singularly perfect, and that she had somewhat mixed feelings about Rebecca West, who she called a cross between a charwoman and a gypsy. Um, al although, although she did very much admire and approve of her arrant feminism, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about that. One thing is indisputable, Virginia Woolf certainly had a high regard for biography, and she even thought that frivolous gossip had its place in that genre. So with that in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's practitioners of the art. Paula, Paula Burns' The Real Jane Austen was published to coincide with the novelist Bicentenary this year. It paints a vivid picture of Austen's life by focusing on objects that conjure up key moments in her existence. And Paula Byrne has previously written three other successful books. Lorna Gibbs' biography of Rebecca West was published on the 30th anniversary of Rebecca West's death this spring, very recently, just in March. It introduces one of the great British literary figures to a new generation. Lorna's previous biography was of Lady Hester Stanhope, someone who, as it happens, Virginia Woolf admired. Andrew Wilson's Mad Girl's Love Song, published early this year, 50 year to mark F Sylvia Plath's suicide, the 50 years since her su suicide, draws on exclusive interviews with friends, lovers and relatives, and focuses on her early life before her fateful meeting with Ted Hughes. He's also written a biography of Patricia Highsmith. Now, we're very fortunate that in the middle of a particularly hectic and demanding filming schedule, Juliet Stevenson will animate all three lives with dramatic readings from their work. You will currently have seen Juliet in the BBC series The Village, and I know that she's also busy filming for the autumn um, a new major family drama called Atlantis. She's also recently appeared on TV in White Heat, The Hour, The Accused, and Place of Execution, and in the theatre in Duet for One. Now, the format of this evening is that um, Juliet, as I said, will be animating the readings. Um, we're going to start with Jane Austen, after Jane Austen, Rebecca West, and then we'll end with Sylvia Plath. And at the end of the session, there should be time for some questions from the audience. So I'm going to hand over to Paula Byrne.
Thank you so much. It's absolutely lovely to be here. So I'll crack on because we've only got 15 minutes each, so I'm not going to waste any time. Um, I just want to say by way of introduction, I've, I've chosen three particular passages which I think illustrate three very different voices of Jane Austen. Um, so the first one is the moment of inspiration for me writing this new biography. And it's a, it's a moment from my favourite Jane Austen novel, which is Mansfield Park. So Juliet will read it and then I'll come back and, and talk about it. The room was most dear to her, and she would not have changed its furniture for the handsomest in the house, though what had been originally plain had suffered all the ill usage of children, and its greatest elegancies and ornaments were a faded footstool of Julia's work, too ill done for the drawing room, three transparencies made in a rage for transparencies for the three lower panes of one window, where Tintin Abbey held its station between a cave in Italy and a moonlight lake in Cumberland, a collection of family profiles thought unworthy of being anywhere else, over the mantelpiece, and by their side, and pinned against the wall, a small sketch of a ship sent four years ago from the Mediterranean by William, with HMS Antwerp at the bottom, in letters as tall as the main mast. That, uh, seriously, that <laughs> beautifully, beautiful. Um, it almost reduces me to tears, that passage, which I know is a ridiculously sentimental res response. Um, but as I say, it was my inspiration. And th because this is a moment where, the, the f where Fanny Price is talking about her, the room of her own. Um, she's appropriated the East Room, which was the schoolroom um, where she was taught alongside her, her wealthy cousins. Um, and of course, they find her terribly vulgar and stupid. She can't put the map together of Europe. But this room is later appropriated by Fanny as her room. And what she loves about this room is it's full of these beautiful things and objects that mean something to her, but they're objects that nobody else really wants. Um, and just before the passage is a moment when she says these objects are my friends and she's a very friendless heroine Harry, uh, Fanny Price, I rather love her um, but what moves me about, about this is the, the picture of HMS Antwerp which was sent by her naval brother William and there's something very touching I think about the way the letters are as big as the mast um, objects can be they can evoke distant places um, but they can also be the bearers of a very strong emotion so when Fanny Price looks at that picture she thinks of her brother fighting the fear, fiercest maritime war in history. He's out in the Mediterranean. Um, but she's also reminded of one of the only people who really love her. And it struck me in thinking about how I was going to, to, to write this new biography of Jane Austen, when really there's nothing new left. There's nothing new under the sun, really, to write about with Jane Austen. We've, you know, we've, we've uncovered that mind. We've mined it to, to the hilt. And it struck me that perhaps it would be more interesting if I structured it rather than womb to tomb, as we say in the industry, or cradle to grave to structure my biography around objects so some of the objects are real life things the topaz cross that Jane Austen was given by her naval brother which again appears in Mansfield Park for those who know Mansfield Park um, and another object is a cashmere shawl which evokes the distant lands of, of, of the East Indies um, and so I structure it around uh, th these wonderful objects and in thinking about Fanny Price's room where she begins her own sentimental education she reads in that room she contemplates she thinks um, and, and um, she becomes um, this is where she there's a wonderful scene when um, the Crawfords come and, and, and they, they rehearse in her room and she feels really infiltrated um, by this and it strikes me that Jane Austen never had a room of her own she never did. She shared a room with her sister, a bedroom with her sister, but she learned to write on the hoof. And one of my objects, I call it the laptop. It's, it's a writing desk that her father gave her for her 19th birthday. And she learned to write. She travelled a lot, Jane Austen. We have this image of her sitting in the cottage, but in fact, she travelled a lot. And she learned to write on the hoof, but she never ever had a room of her own so famously she would write in the dining room at Chawton creaking door would alert her to someone coming in um, so again one of my objects is this laptop that she once left on a coach and it was winding its way to the West Indies and she had to give chase and find it um, but I really love this idea of Jane Austen um, not having a room of her own but but writing on the hoof in a, in a sort of very modern way and um, my second reading is really quite different I absolutely adore Jane Austen's juvenilia these are the stories she wrote from about 
about the age of 11 to 18, and they're hilarious. If anybody hasn't read them before, I don't think you can really understand Jane Austen if you don't know the juvenilia, because you almost need to see how she hones, works out her craft, and also just how very, very funny she is as a young writer. So my next passage is from the juvenilia, and it's from a short novel called The Three Sisters. And didn't you tell me she was about 12 years old when she wrote it? She was about 12. My dear Fanny, I am the happiest creature in the world, for I have received an offer of marriage from Mr Watts. It is the first I have ever had, and I hardly know how to value it enough. How I will triumph over the Duttons! I do not intend to accept it. At least I believe not but I'm not quite certain. I gave him an equivocal answer and left him. And now, my dear Fanny, I want your advice whether I should accept his offer or not. But, but that you may be able to judge of his merits and the situation of affairs, I will give you an account of them. He's quite an old man, <laughs> about two and thirty. <laughs> Very plain, so plain that I cannot bear to look at him. He's extremely disagreeable, and I hate him more than anybody else in the world. He has a large fortune, and will make great settlements on me. But then he's very healthy. In short, I do not know what to do. If I refuse him, he as good as told me that he should offer himself to Sophia, and if she refused him, to Georgiana, and I could not bear to have either of them married before me. If I accept him, I know I shall be miserable all the rest of my life. For he's very ill-tempered and peevish, extremely jealous, and so stingy that there's no living in the house with him. He told me he should mention the affair to Mama, but I insisted upon it that he did not, for very likely she would make me marry him, whether I would or no. However, probably he has before now, for he never does anything he is desired to do. I believe I shall have him. <laughs> It'll be such a triumph to be married before Sophie, Georgiana and the Duttons. And he promised to have a new carriage on the occasion. But we almost quarrelled about the colour, for I insisted upon its being blue, spotted with silver, and he declared it should be a plain chocolate. And to provoke me more, it should be just as low as his old one. I won't have him. I declare... He said he should come again tomorrow and take my final answer. So I believe I must get him while I can. I know the Duttons will envy me and I shall be able to chaperone Sophie and Georgiana to all the winter balls. But then what will be the use of that when very likely he won't let me go myself? For I know he hates dancing and what he hates himself, he has no idea of any other person's liking. And besides, he talks a great deal of women's always staying at home and such stuff. Oh, I believe I shan't have him. I would refuse him at once if I was certain that neither of my sisters would accept him. And that if they did not, he would not offer to the Duttons. I cannot run such a risk. So if he will promise to have the carriage ordered as I like, I will have him. <laughs> and if not, he may ride in it himself for me. I hope you like my determination. I can think of nothing better. And am your ever affectionate... Mary. <laughs> that was absolutely wonderful. There is the genius Jane Austen in embryo. I mean, talk about shades of pride and prejudice, pairs of sisters. She was 12 when she wrote this letter. And the juvenilia, if you don't know it, it is an absolute treat. And it seems to me when you read the juvenilia, you see what Jane Austen was. She was a Georgian child. She was out to make her family laugh. These were private stories. They were not intended for publication. And it's because of that that you get this wonderful, unfettered, free, unrestrained tone. And there's nothing she doesn't joke about. She jokes about death, drunkenness, adultery, homosexuality. She does it all. And 
it's very striking that her family supported her in this endeavour. And also that her father, he bought her these vellum notebooks and she wrote out as an older woman these in fair copy. This was stuff she was really proud of. And what's particularly touching is she writes them as though they're proper published books. So volume the first, there are chapter divisions, there are headings, there are dedications from the humble author. Jane Austen knew what she wanted out of life and that was to be an author she was absolutely determined to be published, and it was a long, hard road to be published. Um, my third reading is another voice. We have that wonderful voice of the juvenile and that wonderful uh, voice in Mansfield Park. But my third passage um, is that professional woman writer. As I say, she had a long, hard road in getting published, and in the end, she finally got Edgerton's Military Library to publish Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice. Now, this is like Hilary Mantel being published by pen and sword. I mean, it's a quite extraordinary that she was so desperate to be published. She would go with the military library. He'd never published a novelist. He'd never published a woman novelist. But shortly afterwards, she made a very smart move, and she went with John Murray, Byron's publisher, the first woman novelist John Murray had ever published and Jane Austen in this letter is flying high she has four novels under her belt she's got persuasion in the bank she's working on this amazing new beach novel called Sanditon and she's dying and she's she's desperately ill she doesn't know that but she's made it she feels she's made it and she's just published she's, she's publishing Emma and she strikes up a friendship with a courtier who says to her you must um, uh, dedicate Emma to the Prince Regent. She hated the Prince Regent, hated him. And she wrote this beautiful letter saying, do I have to, is it incumbent on me? And the, the courtier said, yes, it's incumbent on you to dedicate it to the Prince Regent. And they struck up a correspondence and this courtier said, can you write a novel like this? And, and she's rather cross at this man's telling her what sort of novels to write. So my last passage is this letter when she says, I'm not going to do that. You are very, very kind in your hints as to the sort of composition which might recommend me at present, and I am fully sensible that an historical romance founded on the house of Saxe-Coburg <laughs> might be much more to the purpose of profit or popularity, but I could no more write a romance than an epic poem. I could not sit seriously down to write a serious romance under any other motive than to save my life. And if it were indispensable for me to keep it up and never relax into laughing at myself or other people, I'm sure I should be hung before I had finished the first chapter. No. I must keep to my own style and go on in my own way. I'm nearly there. So I'll just end by saying I, I love that because this is, again, this wonderful, published, professional woman writer going on in her own way and knowing that what she is what she's doing with these novels is new and it's fresh. And lots of people didn't understand what she was doing because other writers would say, why is she just writing about ordinary life? She knew what she was doing was special. She, was, she had utter faith in her genius. And I love that letter. And it's very interesting. We think of Jane Austen as a romantic writer, don't we? She writes romances. And here she is saying, I couldn't write a, a romance to save my life. And that's not, that's not the sort of novel, novelist she wanted to be. She was a pioneer, as people like Walter Scott recognised. And I just wanted to end with that wonderful voice that it, she never flatters anybody but she just wants to go on in her own way so moving on uh, to Rebecca West now with Lorna and uh, she has asked me to start by reading a short piece from the prologue to Black Lamb and Grey Falcon. I raised myself on my elbow and called through the open door into the other wagon lit. My dear, I know I have inconvenienced you terribly, inconvenienced you terribly by making you take your holiday now, and I know you did not really want to come to Yugoslavia at all. But when you get there, you'll see why I thought it was so important that we should make this journey. It'll all be quite clear once we're in Yugoslavia. There was, 
however, no reply. My husband had gone to sleep. It was, perhaps, as well. I could not have gone on to justify my certainty that this train was taking us to a land where everything was comprehensible, where the mode of life was so honest that it put an end to perplexity. I lay back in the darkness and marvelled that I should be feeling about Yugoslavia as if it were my mother country. For this was 1937, and I had never seen the place till 1936. Indeed, I could remember the first time I ever spoke the name Yugoslavia, and that was only two and a half years ago. It was in a London nursing home. I had had an operation in the new miraculous way. I'd been told beforehand that it would all be quite easy, but before an operation, the unconscious, which is really a shocking old fool, envisages surgery as it was in the Stone Age, and I'd been very, very much afraid. I rebuked myself for not having observed that the universe was becoming beneficent at a great rate, but it was not yet wholly so. My operation wound left me an illusion that I had a load of ice strapped to my body. So to distract me, I had a radio brought into my room, and for the first time I realised how uninteresting life could be and how perverse human appetite. After I'd listened to some talks and variety programmes, I would not have been surprised to hear that there are householders who make arrangements with the local authorities not to empty dustbins, but to fill them. <laughs> Nevertheless, there was always good music, provided by some station or other, and I learned to swing like a trapeze artist from programme to programme in search of it. But one evening, I turned the wrong knob and I found music of a kind other than I sought. The music that is above earth, that lives in the thunderclouds and rolls in human ears. I heard the announcer relate how the King of Yugoslavia had been assassinated in the streets of Marseille that morning. We had passed into another phase of the mystery we were enacting here on earth, and I knew it might be agonizing. It appeared to me inevitable that war must follow, and indeed it must have done had not the Yugoslavian government exercised an iron control on its population, then and thereafter, and abstained from the smallest provocative action against its enemies. That forbearance, which is one of the most extraordinary feats of statesmanship performed in post-war Europe, I could not be expected to foresee. So I rang for my nurse. And when she came, I cried to her, switch on the telephone. I must speak to my husband at once. A most terrible thing has happened. The king of Yugoslavia has been assassinated. Oh, dear, she replied. <laughs> Did you know him? <laughs> no, I said. Well, then why, she asked. Do you think it's so terrible? Her question made me remember that the word idiot comes from a Greek root meaning a private person. Idiocy is the female defect. Intent on their private lives, women follow their fate through a darkness deep as that cast by malformed cells in the brain. It is no worse than the male defect, which is lunacy. <laughs> they are so obsessed by public affairs that they see the world as by moonlight, which shows the outline of every object, but not the details indicative of their nature. I said... Well, you know, assassinations do lead to other things. Do they? she asked. <laughs> do they not? I sighed. For when I came to look back on it, my life had been punctuated by the slaughter of royalties and by the shouting of newsboys who have run down the streets to tell me that someone has used a lethal weapon to turn over a new leaf in the book of history. There was the Empress Elizabeth of Austria, I said to the nurse. Oh, she was beautiful, wasn't she? She said. One of the most beautiful women who ever lived, I said. But wasn't she mad? She said. <laughs> Perhaps, I said. Perhaps, but only a little. And at the end, she was certainly brilliantly clever. Before she was 30, she had given proof of her greatness. How? She asked. To her increasing distress, I told her, for I know quite a lot about Habsburg history, <laughs> until I saw how bored she was and let her go and leave me in my darkness.
The reason I chose that piece that was read so beautifully by Julia is that um, it really illustrates one of the, the prime brilliant things about Rebecca as a writer, which is that she refused to fit into any of the categories that writers had written within until that point. So you were saying Jane Austen was a pioneer, and Rebecca was very much a pioneer too. Um, Black Lamb was very much her magnum opus. It's a huge book. It's over a 1,000 pages long. People look at it and think, this is much too long. I'm not going to read it. But it's worth the effort, honestly, because it's not just a book about the dissolution of a country, but it's also a book about the difference between private and public life. So while it is a picture of a country, it's a picture of former Yugoslavia, it's also the story of Rebecca and her husband. It's fictionalised slightly, and the characters in it who are based on real people that she met in her travels, their personalities are changed slightly to make them more interesting or to make them fit the plot better. But it's marketed and, and was promoted as a non-fiction book. So this weaving of fact and fiction, this mix of real history, this kind of muddle of a life, is kind of core to one of the reasons I wanted to write about Rebecca. Rebecca West's own life was very much caught between these two things, this idea of idiocy and lunacy. She herself thought of herself very much as an idiot. She thought of herself very much as someone who was driven by her personal life. And indeed, there are many, many points in her life when she writes in her journals and her diaries, oh God, I wish I wasn't in love with X because then I would be able to focus more on my writing. Or I wish X's wife would leave him because then I'd be able to focus more on my writing. Of course, this public and private thing is, is something that, that's well known in Rebecca's life through her affair with H.G. Wells, her kind of the way that she had to keep her relationship quite secret because they didn't, although Wells' wife didn't mind it and actually kind of tacitly accepted Wells' affairs, she didn't want them to be publicly known because she felt that the kind of um, disgrace of other people knowing she accepted it wouldn't be acceptable. So there was this onus on Rebecca to keep the affair quite quiet, but at the same time uh, to live quite a public life as a writer and to write about interesting things. I want to talk a little bit about where that dichotomy between private and public originated, which is in Rebecca's own background. And then I want to talk a little bit about how it infected her work and why it makes her work so powerful and so unique. Rebecca's childhood was actually quite poor. She herself described it as shabby gentility. Her parents were bohemian, they were artists. Her dad had written for the Glasgow Herald. He was quite a good artist. Her mum played the piano at one point playing for an evangelical um, couple and kind of banging out glory hymns on the piano. However, her father had quite a dark past. He'd been in jail. He um, behaved quite disgracefully. He would bring prostitutes into the house. And his wife, constantly faced with this um, obvious uh, infidelity, would say, but you won't leave me for them. And he'd say, no, no, I'm not going to leave you. You're my wife. So the girls grew up with this, with this notion that their family was odd, wasn't quite respectable, but at the same time were very determined to present respectability. And class was a huge thing. They worried constantly about their class. Were they good enough? Would they be able to achieve what they wanted to achieve? And their mother did everything she could to try and give them the veneer of respectability that their father and much of the rest of their unconventional lifestyle seemed to prohibit. Rebecca seemed to embrace this in some ways, so she became a suffragette, in spite of the fact that her mother wasn't quite sure it was the right thing to do. She went to RADA, 
left RADA without actually graduating, but nevertheless was determined to become an actress. Um, and at the same time, was gaining quite a strong reputation for her own firebrand feminist um, sort of writing that was attracting people. She reviewed for various magazines and got quite a good reputation until at one point she came across a book written by Mr. H.G. Wells called Marriage. And I'm just going to read a tiny bit. Sorry, Juliet. So you have to forgive me because I'm not. Yet. <laughs> um, Mr. Wells' mannerisms are more infuriating than ever in marriage. One knows at once that Marjorie is speaking in a crisis of wedded chastity when she says at regular intervals, Oh, my dear! Oh, my dear! Or at moments of ecstasy, Oh, my dear! My dear! For Mr. Wells' heroines, who are loving under legal difficulties, say, My man or master. Of course, he is just the old maid among novelists. Even the sex obsession that lay clotted on Anne Veronica and the new Machiavelli like cold white sauce was merely old maid's mania. The reaction towards the flash of a mind too long absorbed in airships and colloids. Mr Wells was quite upset by this and invited her to tea. And the affair took its time in happening. It, was quite a, it, it wasn't what most people commonly think, that they immediately started having an affair. Actually, they didn't. Um, Wells was quite reluctant. He was quite happy with the mistresses he had on the go. He didn't really want a new, young, difficult mistress. But once the affair had started, the duplicity had to begin all over again. So Rebecca's professional life was largely put on hold. She moved around various towns in the south coast, had her young child, and was finding it very difficult to write, largely because uh, she didn't have a room, she didn't have a space. The spaces that she inhabited were very much uh, bed and breakfast type places. She said a lot of her energy was taken up with trying to perpetuate the lie, the stories that, that she had to to kind of work to, to keep the affair in the position it had to be in. And later, this became a real loss for her. So if you look at her journals for later, she thinks, what might I have written in those years? She does write some wonderful journalism. She wrote a fantastic piece about the girls that worked in the cordite factories during the First World War. It's incredibly moving and incredibly powerful. But Wells is constantly poo-pooing a work and saying it's not important. And from this, we get a real sense of insecurity. And in a sense, that insecurity becomes Rebecca's curse, but it also becomes her blessing. A curse insofar as she doesn't quite have the confidence. So at one point, when Virginia Woolf is being quite scathing about her, she is very hurt and writes, um, it's to do with the charwoman and the gypsy um, quote that was mentioned at the beginning. She, she says, of course, you know, I don't have Virginia Woolf's class. I don't have her background, but I'm wittier than she is. And she's very proud of her wit and her quickness. And she feels that she really can face Virginia Woolf on this level. And there's a kind of game between the two of them. Rebecca, insecure Rebecca, is waiting for approval for a word about various books that, that she knows Wolf has read, and she's waiting to hear, does she like them? Meanwhile, Wolf is also waiting to hear from Rebecca. And there's this kind of tense stalemate between them, and when they do get together, it's never very nice. So Virginia Woolf thinks that Rebecca's flat is tasteless and overdone and looks um, nouveau riche. It looks tacky. It's kind of footballer's wives. It's not what she would have. Um, whereas um, Rebecca thinks Virginia Woolf is living a life of privilege. She's never really had to work. If she had to work, then maybe she would explore the form of her books more. Maybe she would try and do something different. This is where Rebecca's insecurity is actually a blessing because she does explore. And she writes novels. She writes brilliant journalism. She writes about the Nuremberg trials. She writes about espionage. 
And she ends up with this huge canonic body of work that isn't quite easy to categorise. And sadly, therefore, gets lost. Doesn't achieve the long-lasting fame of Jane Austen or Virginia Woolf. Doesn't quite enter the long-term consciousness of people. And it's a shame. It's a real shame because there's brilliant and beautiful stuff there just waiting to be found. Um, I've got, Juliet's going to read another piece, but just before she does, one thing Rebecca did say was she felt that the reason she didn't achieve that kind of longevity, that kind of long-lasting acclaim was because she committed the unforgivable sin. And the unforgivable sin was to be a woman writer who lives a long life and goes on writing, one who doesn't die young like Catherine Mansfield and doesn't commit suicide like Virginia Woolf. I'm going to pass you over to Juliet to read a, a not very well-known piece by Rebecca about music and about how she feels music infused her life and filled her life. And indeed, at, at one point, she said music was the space that she worked in. So it seemed a, a nice, appropriate for the topic. It's called My Relations with Music. My relations with music have been abnormal because my relations with sound are abnormal. They always have been. When I was a little child, there were two forms of torment which I had to suffer without the slightest sympathy from my elders. Though they were ready enough to comfort me when I had to undergo suffering, which seemed to me to be much less like a cold in the chest or a bruise on the knee. One of the torments I had to face alone and unsuccored was attendance at church, for the reason that the sound of an organ gave me a pain as bad as acute toothache. It was a pain that ran from a point above my left ear. I remember well the direction in which the grinding screw always followed from left to right. I still feel this distress at the sound of any organ. The other torment I endured was the ghastly row that filled any railway terminal. For the first few years, we lived in London, and when we went for holidays, I started to cry as soon as we got into the cab in anticipation of the assault I was going to endure as soon as I was dragged into Waterloo or Victoria or King's Cross or Euston. The noise the locomotives made seemed to beat me on the head and the body indiscriminately. I used to be hauled into the railway carriage in a state of dripping misery, which nobody understood. How magical my mother then appeared to me as she sat down at the piano and evoked sounds that caused me no pain whatsoever, but instead were pure pleasure. She played Schumann and Beethoven and Mozart and Chopin and a good deal of Mendelssohn, songs without words, which was meat and drink to me for the reason that made them suspect to other generations. They were such pleasant sounds that they balanced the torment of the organ and the locomotive. For me, there is a special value in those songs without words. I imagine every performer on any musical instrument outside percussion wants to achieve a perfect legato, and how these pieces helped even me to get nearer that aim. When I was in my late twenties, I performed the unusual feat of getting pneumonia in my left ear and my hearing altered. I used to hear the notes of a scale as going up or coming down. A note was high or not so high or lower or low, with the same meaning as when those terms refer to the steps of a staircase or points on a slope. <coughs> but since I had this affliction of the ear, it has all been different. I cannot quite define what I hear. A piece of music is now, for me, something like a film representation of an island over which the sea is washing leaving parts of it exposed, but submerging others. All is under strong light, and the exposed parts glimmer. The island is of shifting, dark, rich colours, the sea of shifting, richer and lighter colours. But that some notes are high, and that some are low, never now occurs to me. I live with mystery. Music is part of human life, and partakes of the human tragedy. 
There is much more music in the world than is allowed to change into heard sounds and prove its point. Music partakes also of the human mystery. It is something that the ear contrives for its own pleasure, but my ears are damaged, and music is not destroyed for me. It seems to have an independent existence. What music means to me above all is that I can believe that on a silent globe it might still exist, and that if people go back to the moon, they might quite suddenly hear something. The lifeless moon might be like Beethoven, deaf, but still a composer. My defence has been the capacity for pure pleasure inherited from my father and my mother. The pleasure with which he used to paint watercolours and talk of historical and political matters which made him glow. The pleasure with which she played Schumann's Carnival and looked at the mellow brick and creamy stone of Hampton Court or the Georgian houses around Ham. That pleasure was my perpetual anaesthetic and stimulant. And because of it, I have not had such a bad life after all. So, so now we are... <laughs> Now we're moving on to Andrew and to uh, Sylvia Plath. And he has asked me uh, to kick off by reading the poem which um, forms the title of his book, Mad Girl's Love Song, which was not, was it, published in, in Hughes's collection no. of her work? No. I shut my eyes and all the world drops dead. I lift my lids, and all is born again. I think I made you up inside my head. The stars go waltzing out in blue and red, and arbitrary blackness gallops in. I shut my eyes, and all the world drops dead. I dreamed that you bewitched me into bed, and sung me moonstruck, kissed me quite insane. I think I made you up inside my head. God topples from the sky, hell's fires fade, exit seraphim and Satan's men. I shut my eyes and all the world drops dead. I fancied you'd return the way you said, but I grow old and I forget your name. I think I made you up inside my head. I should have loved a thunderbird instead. At least when spring comes, they roar back again. I shut my eyes and all the world drops dead. I think I made you up inside my head. Thank you, Juliet. That's lovely. Um, a wonderful poem. But as Juliet said, it's missing from um, the collected um, poems published um, in 1981. It was edited by Ted Hughes, who, has, as we know, um, was Sylvia Plath's husband. Um, that poem was written in 1953. Um, it's a wonderful ev evocation of um, Plath waiting for this, this boyfriend, Myra Lotz, who didn't turn up one day. and She has this extraordinary intensity of feeling. Um, there's a number of reasons, I think, why it was missed out from the collected poems. Um, one of the reasons was Ted Hughes liked to see Plath's work in two big parts, post-1956 and pre-1956. Um, and 1956 seemed to be a very important date for him. And we sort of look at the introduction to the collected poems, and he writes in that introduction about this split between what he calls Plath's juvenilia. Um, he sort of talks about it in this kind of the false selves that she's slipped off, this kind of transformation. These juvenile poems are kind of toxic byproducts 
and anything that was sort of post-1956. But we have to remember that 56 was the year in which Sylvia Plath met Ted Hughes <laughs> and married. Um, so that's a sort of fascinating kind of introduction. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to call my book Mad Girls Love Song after that, that poem, because it sort of sets up the sort of the themes there very, very um, beautifully, I think. Um, you sort of, if you want to sort of take that title apart, um, the mad girl in the title in my book is not a woman who goes insane. It's a woman who's an angry young woman. And in my book, I sort of try to look at the sources of her anger. Why is she such an angry young woman? Um, basically, we're here to talk about um, rooms of one's own. And Sylvia Plath, like the other two writers we're talking about tonight, didn't have a room of her own in which to write. She shared a room with her mother in a very, very small house in Wellesley, um, just outside Boston. As we know, her father, Otto, died when she was only eight years old, and that was a great traumatic event and obviously a source of great cre creativity for Sylvia Plath. Um, so Sylvia Plath moved into this, this very small house. It was a two-bedroomed house. And in this two-bedroom house, there was Aurelia, her mother, Warren, um, Sylvia Plath's brother, and um, Aurelia's two parents, Sylvia Plath's grandparents. There were five people living in this small two-bedroom house. And I, I don't know if any of you have seen the film Sylvia with Gwyneth Paltrow, in which you sort of look at this this extraordinary house which is sort of a mansion with wings and a lawn that goes on forever <laughs> and in fact the reality was um, Sylvia came from a very very modest background um, so modest in fact that um, she was quite ashamed of taking boys back to this this home and there's a very poignant line in her diaries where she writes about how um, when boys, when she invited boys back to her house she would have to dim the lights down so they wouldn't see the kind of the stains and the rips in the wallpaper. And I think that image tells you an awful lot about the reality of Sylvia Plath's day-to-day -day life. She was a scholarship girl that went to Smith College. And Smith College is one of the elite universities for women in America. At the time, it was full of the daughters of the great and the good. So she was mixing with these, these daughters of extraordinarily wealthy people. And she felt um, self-consciously lowly of status. Her journals are full and packed full of... Um, barbed comments about, about um, you know, these kind of wonderfully privileged women. Um, and as we know, um, as we sort of were here to celebrate the theme of a room of one's own, as Virginia Woolf said, that what a woman needed in order to write fiction or any kind of creative writing was some kind of money, some kind of source of money and a room, a, a space, a mental space or a physical space of one's own. Um, as I said, Sylvia didn't really have that. So what she did, she created it through her journals. Um, so when she was a very young girl, her mother gave her um, a journal. Probably she regretted that very much later in life because Sylvia turned the pen on her mother. She was one of the many characters that she attacked both in her journals and in the bell jar. Um, she doesn't come across as a very um, sympathetic character in that. So Sylvia started to write these journals, and they're extraordinarily vivid and compulsive pieces of writing. You know, they go on for pages and pages. Um, so she started to create this kind of room of her own, an imaginative space, if you like. Um, when she went to Smith, she actually had a physical room of her own for the first time. Um, so she started to, to write sto stories and poems. And... Writing was a reality, an economic reality for her because of her economic circumstances. She had to write to earn money, like Jane Austen and like Rebecca West. She was one of these women that had, um, one of these people that had an extraordinary des desire to write, but also an economic compulsion to write. If she didn't write, she wouldn't be able to top up her expenses. Um, so she would fall short and she would probably... Um, not really be able to, to meet the economic satisfaction and the money that she needed to to stay at Smith College. Um, so what, what she did, she sort of she started to write stories for popular magazines. Later in life, Ted Hughes really wouldn't want to acknowledge some of this kind of work because he sort of thought it was dross. Um, this is some of the juvenilia that I mentioned. But actually, when you sort of start to look at some of these stories, they're absolutely fascinating. And... Um, one of the stories that she wrote um, was for a magazine, a popular magazine, 
called Seventeen. I suppose it's the equivalent of a teenage magazine today, but actually it had extraordinarily good writing in. And then she said progressed to Mademoiselle. Um, that was full of some of the best writers in the world. You know, people normally published by higher um, literary journals like The New Yorker. Um, and of course, um, when Sylvia Plath went to do an internship at Mademoiselle in the summer of 1953, she found that experience too much. It was the summer, of course, that inspired the bell jar. Um, I don't know if any, anybody, many people here will have read that, but, um, of course, it's the 50th anniversary of the bell jar, and it's an extraordinary book. It's an extraordinarily powerful book, full of um, amazing kind of imagery, the story of a, of a young woman alone in New York, um, and sort of coming up with um, a competition, an equal competition with other women of her own age who were just as talented as her. Um, she came back from that experience in New York, a broken woman. She um, returned to her mother's house, the two-bedroom house in Wellesley, feeling shattered, emotionally drained. And finally, she tried to commit suicide. She crawled down to the crawl space underneath the house, like a basement, with a bottle of sleeping pills and took them. And this, what, this is the, the room that Plath thought she would end her life in. This was her ultimate room of her own, if you like. Um, but her brother heard her cries and finally she was rescued. Um, she was taken to hospital and then she was placed in an upscale um, psychiatric hospital where she underwent ECT. But she went under, e under ECT with a kind of a horrible, um, it was an awful experience because it was done without anaesthetic. So she could almost feel like she was being <coughs> electrocuted. Um, one of, the, one of the sort of things that she writes about in her journal was this kind of link between being a woman, a female writer, and a sense of punishment. Um, bizarrely, one of her creative writing um, tutors, a man, in the class addressed all these e extraordinarily imaginative, clever young women and said, well, I hope none of you are going to be a... I hope none of you want to be a writer because female writers come to terribly unhappy ends. Um, and this, she came out of that kind of meeting um, full of fury. Um, as I said, she's, she was an angry young woman. Another, one, another source of the anger that sort of you can sort of trace throughout her fiction and her non-fiction is this kind of sexual hypocrisy that went on in America. I mean, looking back at the dating rituals of Jane Austen, it's more or less the same kind of elaborate rituals that were going on in 1950s America. There was all this kind of um, system of heavy petting and parking, which was uh, the term they used for it, where a man, usually a, a young man, would drive his date to an isolated area where they would sort of indulge in kind of some kind of heavy, heavy petting. But whereas a man could experiment sexually, of course a woman had to remain a virgin until marriage. So, Plath was full of this kind of sexual energy, but it was a sexual energy that she felt she had to repress and suppress. Um, another source of her anger um, was this sense of the limited possibilities that were open for women. Um, even though she went to this elite college for women, Smith College, um, really at the end of it, the possibility, the, um, the main possibility for, for women was marriage. In 1955, um, at the graduation ceremony, um, Adlai Stevenson, who was a Democrat, who was the governor of Illinois, came to give the graduation address. And in his message, he said, after all these, the, you know, the, these women have been there for four years, learning the, the best and the brightest type of education they could possibly have. So he said to them, your goal in life now is to leave Smith College and um, form a creative marriage. So inform your husband and try to shape his judgment, but really don't expect a career. Um, and this is 1955. Um, so and looking at some of the kind of statistics in, uh, involved around the time, only one third of women who actually went to college in the 1950s actually graduated. Um, the, yes, there was a boom in the kind of labour market for women. I think between 1950 and 1960, the figures went up from 18 million to 23 million, but most of those jobs were kind of clerical jobs, secretarial jobs. So any kind of woman who wanted to shape, um, make a, a profession for herself in 1950s America found it incredibly difficult. So, again, Plath turned this sense of anger inwards. She started to write these extraordinarily journal entries, which is so powerful to read today. 
Um, and those are some of the kind of um, themes that I try to use um, in the book. It's a kind of a book that explores Plath as a young woman. As I say, it's a book that um, really is about her life before Ted Hughes. Um, they met in 1956 at this extraordinarily powerful meeting in Cambridge, um, which has gone down in you know, one of the most extraordinarily powerful and passionate um, encounters in all literary history at this party to launch a student journal. You know, they had this uh, in, enormous sense of passion um, and Ted Hughes rips the hairband from her head and rips the earrings from her ears and she in turn bites him hard on the cheek drawing blood. Um, and you know, that kind of that strong imagery is there and the kind of the rivalry is there between them as, as creative writers. So I sort of begin my book um, with that party and I sort of end with that that party and that kind of marriage only four months later um, there were many many interesting characters many men who informed her writing before Ted Hughes possibly the most important one um, is somebody called Richard Sassoon who perhaps was not her ideal type of man he was the same kind of height as her he was sort of dark-eyed and I think Plath um, describes him as being something of looking like a, um, an absinthe addict at one point. Um, but she fell passion passionately in love with him. She said he had the one quality that no American man had, and that was intuition. He came from a, a tradition of European um, sophistication and, and bohemian spirit, not an American one. He was sort of born in, in, in Britain and he grew up in Paris. So he had, had a very different tradition. But she became incredibly um, engaged and thrilled and infatuated by him. And what many people don't realise is the fact that she actually was still in love with Richard Sassoon when she met um, Ted Hughes. So you get this extraordinary meeting, you know, with the, the ripping of the hairband and the biting of the cheek and the blood. Um, but then Plath leaves Ted Hughes. She goes back to Paris, where Richard Sassoon is at the Sorbonne, to search him down because she's still incredibly in love with him. Um, but she finds Richard Sue not to be there. He rejects her. He's gone to, to Spain. Um, she's incredibly traumatised by this experience. Um, and what does she do? She returns back to Britain and falls into the arms of Ted Hughes. And there is, you know, the rest of the story. They become man and wife only four months after that first passionate meeting. They have two children, um, Frida and Nicholas. Um, they, they move to Devon, then... Um, the marriage breaks up, um, Sylvie discovers all the horrible truth about his infidelity um, and she moves back to, to London with her two small children and where she has perhaps another room of her own, this flat, this, this you know, very cold flat, you know, it's the coldest winter I think for 50 years um, and one day in, in February 1963, unable to stand it, any longer, um, there's various theories surrounding her suicide. Um, she puts the two children in, in their cots, leaves them bread and milk, as we know, and seals the doors and the windows, and then places her head in the gas oven and kills herself, and she was only 30 years old. Um, now, obviously, it's 50 years since her death, it's 50 years since the publication of The Bell Jar, but it's also 50 years since the publication of another very important book, which is Betty Friedan's book, um, The Feminine Mystique, which was published in 1963. And I think f sort of feminism for Plath came a little bit too, too late, a bit too little too late for her. Um, you know, I like to think if she'd lived a bit longer, perhaps she would have benefited from this second wave of feminism. Um, but as I said, you know, 50 years, 50 years on, you, we sort of see this extraordinary, wonderful writer and, you know, the echoes of her life still reverberate today. She's an extraordinarily enduring writer. You know, she's, she's on school syllabuses. The bell jar is, is you know, set as an O-level text now, a GCSE text, I should say. And um, I sort of like to think of her as this kind of extraordinarily vibrant figure that continues to haunt our consciousness. Um, she's almost like, you know, this archetypal Lady Lazarus. And as she says in that poem, out of the ash I rise with my red hair and I eat men like her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so we're going to finish with a poem of um, Sylvia Plath's called Tulips. And um, I think, you correct me if I'm wrong, I think this was written by her <clears throat> after she'd had a miscarriage, um, which had been also sh followed on shortly from a terrible, terrible explosion in their <laughs> marriage where in a fit of great jealousy, she had torn a lot of his work up one morning when he came back late from a meeting with some woman in the literary world, in the publishing world or something, and she, he'd been, he, he'd been much later than, than she anticipated, and she, in a fit of jealousy about what might be happening, she tore up a lot of his work. Is that right, Andrew? I think so, yes. Yeah. And then, um, shortly after, had a miscarriage, um, was taken to hospital, and so on the theme of rooms of their own, here she is in her hospital room, um, alone and uh, it's called Tulips The tulips are too excitable It is winter here Look how white everything is How quiet How snowed in I am learning peacefulness Lying by myself quietly as the light lies on these white walls, this bed, these hands. I am nobody. I have nothing to do with explosions. I have given my name and my day clothes up to the nurses and my history to the anaesthetist and my body to surgeons. They have propped my head between the pillow and the sheet cuff like an eye between two white lids that will not shut. Stupid pupil, it has to take everything in. The nurses pass and pass. They are no trouble. They pass the way gulls pass inland in their white caps, doing things with their hands, one just the same as another. So it is impossible to tell how many there are. My body is a pebble to them. They tend it as water tends to the pebbles it must run over, smoothing them gently. They bring me numbness in their bright needles. They bring me sleep. Now I have lost myself, I am sick of baggage. My patent leather overnight case like a black pillbox. My husband and child smiling out of the family photo. Their smiles catch onto my skin. Little smiling hooks. I have let things slip. A thirty-year-old cargo boat stubbornly hanging on to my name and address. They have swabbed me clear of my loving associations. Scared and bare on the green plastic pillowed trolley, I watched my tea set, my bureaus of linen, my books sink out of sight. And the water went over my head. I am a nun now. I have never been so pure. I didn't want any flowers. I only wanted to lie with my hands turned up and be utterly empty. How free it is. You have no idea how free. The peacefulness is so big it dazes you. And it asks nothing. A name tag, a few trinkets. It is what the dead close on, finally. I imagine them shutting their mouths on it like a communion tablet. The tulips are too red in the first place. They hurt me. Even through the gift paper, I could hear them breathe lightly through their white swaddlings like an awful baby. Their redness talks to my wounds. It corresponds. They are subtle. They seem to float, though they weigh me down, upsetting me with their sudden tongues and their colour, a dozen red lead sinkers round my neck. Nobody watched me before. Now I am watched. The tulips turn to me, and the window behind me, where once a day the light slowly widens and slowly thins, and I see myself flat, ridiculous, a cut paper shadow between the eye of the sun and the eyes of the tulips. And I have no face. I have wanted to efface myself. The vivid tulips eat my oxygen. Before they came, the air was calm enough, coming and going, breath by breath, without any fuss. 
Then the tulips filled it up like a loud noise. Now the air snags and eddies round them the way a river snags and eddies round a sunken rust-red engine. They concentrate my attention that was happy playing and resting without committing itself. The walls also seem to be warming themselves. Those tulips should be behind bars like dangerous animals. They are opening like the mouth of some great African cat. And I'm aware of my heart. It opens and closes its bowl of red blooms out of sheer love of me. The water I taste is warm and salt like the sea and comes from a country far away as health. It's wonderful, all of you. But um, before I wrap up, um, we do have a little time for questions. I know this, these are very hard acts to follow. Um, it's, it's, I think we can understand we need a bit of a pause. But I'm going to field the questions. Um, can I ask to start with, does anyone have a, a question that might apply to all three of the biographers this evening? Has anybody been wanting to ask something that might be a general question um, for, for all three of our speakers this evening? Okay, okay uh, that's one oh, over there. Oh, is one over here? Sorry. The light's so strong. Okay. Okay, can you give a... Could you stand up, please? That's, thank you. Had a room of their own that they wrote in. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Yeah. Okay, you all heard that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Should we start then with the uh, caller? Well, it's a, so the question was: do, the, do, do we all have a room of our own? And it's really interesting if you don't mind me saying that when we were talking about all of our writers never had a room of their own. And it made me think, maybe you don't need a room of your own. It sort of flies in the face of Virginia Woolf saying women need a room of their own, because none of us did. Um, and I work rather well in chaos. <laughs> I come from a large family and I have children, so I actually like the chaos of... I do, I'm do. i very lucky to have got a beautiful Georgian study with the light pouring in, so I do have a room of my own. But I, I just end up writing on the kitchen table because I like the noise. So maybe Virginia Woolf's wrong. <laughs> Well, I think there's this idea that if you um, have a beautiful room, it's very good for creativity. But I know lots of writers who actually go into bunkers and they kind of put the light, the, you know, the blinds down. They have something very ugly to look at. And I think that actually is almost a very kind of it's a good urge towards creativity. I live in a, a sort of a beautiful um, part of Devon with an extraordinarily beautiful view. But I have to stop myself from looking out the like, out of the window. So like you, I don't purposely don't go into my office, I sit at the kitchen table. <laughs> and of course that's because of the, we had a very cold winter, so being by the auger it makes a big difference. Well, I live in a very small one-bedroom flat in London with my husband, so I don't have luxury of a spare room. Yeah. But um, what we did was we actually, um, we've, we've partitioned off a bit of the living room, and that's really my study. So I've kind of got a wall of books behind me. And that's quite nice, actually. I quite like it. I, I, don't like, I wouldn't like feeling too isolated either. I have to say, Rebecca did eventually have a whole house of her own. But <laughs> it, was, it took, took a while for her to get there. Um, I, I think I'm like Paul. I, I quite like people and cats and things happening in the house while I'm working. I wouldn't like to be too cut off. Ted Hughes always said his best work was ever written in, a in, in the flat in London that he shared. He had a tiny little desk in, in a hall, and he said that was the best room, and it was absolutely, it probably was like a bit like Roald Dahl's bunk, because he like, wrote in a shed that was like a bunker. He thought about him being in the world. He was a pilot in the war, wasn't he, Roald Dahl? And he recreated being in a, in a plane. It's quite interesting. Okay, thanks. Any more questions for all three authors? Uh, there's a question in the middle here. Thank you. Wait a minute, we're just getting um, a microphone over to you. Okay. I would just like to ask you, what is the point of writing a biography of a poet? Is it on the one hand to make people read their poetry again in a different way? 
Or is it just like any biographer to tell you something you didn't know before about the author? Um, so, is that for everybody or just for... Uh, everybody. Okay, so what what's the point of writing? I think actually okay. it's for all of you. For writers, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. I suppose yeah. What's the, the point is... of writing the biography of a writer? Is is it to encourage more readers for their original work, or to read the biography, or both? Well, I think with with Plath, I don't think you probably need um, people to be encouraged to read Plath's work because I think she's a poet that's continued to be read. Um, I think with Plath. For me, one of the reasons why I decided to write about her was because, um, just because you know, we we are all fascinated by um, stories of geniuses, and we want to know where that kind of talent came from. So, for me to look at Sylvia Plath's life before Ted Hughes, for many many people, um, you know, this association that she became a writer only when she married him, but my point is actually you can trace the genius right back to when she was a child. And, you know, any, all of us, I think, you know, the fascination where, where genius comes from and that source of genius is, is an enduringly fascinating question. Yeah, I think, um, for me, it was partly to make people revisit Rebecca's work and to try and give her a new audience which is kind of much less famous now than she was even 20 years ago but I was very interested in her personal life because um, she wasn't that secretive about it there are lots of journals lots of diary entries lots of a huge wealth of material that hadn't really been mined in terms of her personal traumas and she's someone who really felt that her personal life affected her work hugely and wrote voluminously about how various love affairs, various passions, really affected what she could do. And I was very interested to explore this in a biography. I don't think you can really look at her work without knowing about her life because they're so closely entwined. I think we're all literary biographers and what one wants to do with a literary biographer is bring perhaps new audiences to the work or perhaps even to go back and see the work in a new light. I mean, I think people think they know Jane Austen because they've watched a few DVDs and whilst I think the DVDs are absolutely fabulous, they don't really tell you anything about how amazingly brilliant she is as a writer. So for me, I did like to, I did try to smuggle a lot of literary criticism in because I, I'm very interested in her, the embryo, how she became a writer and, and her struggle to become a writer. Um, but I think almost it's helpful to know what actually that, that link between the life and the works is what literary biographers are interested in um, and as I say for me it's very much trying to encourage um, new writers to come back to Jane Austen Is there another question? Anybody? Oh this one there oh, Where's the one? Okay um, and this is going to be the last question anyway okay Thank um, I just wondered as, as a <laughs> I just wondered as a group because of the, um, the suicide that hangs over Virginia Woolf and, and Sylvia Plath what you thought um, the relationship between the catharsis of writing and the actual destructiveness of writing and how that affects the people that you write about that's a really interesting question did everybody hear that question no, no? okay um, it, it, yeah, I think there may be a problem with that, um, Mike. Is that bearing in mind um, Sylvia Plath's suicide? Uh, suicide has been mentioned in relation to you know why um, Rebecca West's longevity might um, maybe stood against her enduring fame. Obviously, um, this event is to a certain extent a tribute to Virginia Woolf. The question was um, what, what the relationship between the catharsis of writing for writers um, and the, the potential destructiveness of writing. Who would like to go first? Okay. Well, I, I suppose, it, I mean, it's one of those very complex issues. Um, but certainly Sylvia Plath was fascinated by Virginia Woolf. And in her journals, you can sort of see many, many entries exploring this very concept. Why did people like Sarah Teasdale was another writer that she was fascinated by. She, an American poet who committed suicide. Virginia Woolf obviously committed suicide. Um, Sylvia Plath, um, from a very early age, had a death wish, I think. You can sort of see that from a very early age. At age 10 and 14, she was a self-harmer, as the kind of 
the parlance goes nowadays, she cut herself. Um, obviously, in the 1930s, 1940s, that was something that was not considered to be symptomatic. It wouldn't have been picked up by any doctor. It certainly wouldn't have had any kind of classification. Um, but I think Sylvia Plath and writing, those two things just go to, together because she lived for writing. Um, it's very fascinating when she had her nervous breakdown and she went to McLean, the hospital that I mentioned. She, um, and after having ECT, she couldn't um, form any kind of words. Her high school um, teacher would come along and bring this kind of game, which is equivalent to our kind of Scrabble, so Sylvie could make letters, and she couldn't even, you know, spell the word and, A-N-D. So her capability to form words and form language was such at a low point. Um, but she couldn't envisage a time and a life without writing. Um, throughout her poetry, she just plays games with sort of metaphors. And in one of her poems, she talks about this landscape where cabbages are cabbages and kings are kings. Metaphor doesn't exist. So I think Plath was looking at a, a possibility of another mental breakdown, perhaps, another possibility where she would never be able to form um, language um, or create language, and perhaps that is one of the um, reasons that can possibly explain his suicide. Uh, one thing that's not very well known about Rebecca West, she, when she was young um, and she wanted to have the affair with Wells and he wasn't being particularly keen, she did actually threaten suicide. So her mother, who thought this was a perfectly stupid reaction from a silly young girl, although she was in her 20s at the time, took her to Spain, where she then wrote a series of three very dramatic articles about suicides and about um, the power of travel. And uh, I think the power of travel stayed with her, but the idea of suicide completely went. I, she wasn't someone who seemed to kind of write about it as a possibility at all, and was actually quite nasty about people who did. So she wasn't sympathetic, what a shame. She was kind of, oh gosh, why did they do that then? You know, it was a kind of puzzle. And she had a lot of really sad and terrible things happen to her. But um, suicide didn't really seem an issue. It was more about revenge with Rebecca. How can I get my own back? Mm. What can I do to them? And I quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> Jane Austen lived in the age of sensibility when links between suicide and great passion um, were, were sort of promulgated by Goethe's Sorrow as a Young Verta being one of the texts. Um, and it, it was, I mean, people read The Sorrows of Young Goethe, in which this young man um, loses the love of his life and kills himself. And there were copycat suicides all over the 18th century. Jane Austen thought this was A, hilariously stupid um, and a really bad idea. And she loved nothing more than to satirise the code of sensibility that unashamedly placed the individual's feelings first. I, 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 me, me, me. Oh, I must cry tears of passion because I'm so sensitive. So she writes this very funny parody in her juvenilia called Love and Friendship, in which the two heroines who are thieves and murderers and vile keep talking about how refined their sensibility is and one of them runs mad and the other one falls into fainting fits and she falls into a fainting fit and gets cold and dies so Jane Austen is run mad as often as you wish but never fall into a fainting fit <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks well um, um, obviously I'd like to thank um, our three amazing um, biographers this evening. Um, I, I would like to say that all, um, if, if there'd be more time, I was going to ask a question about biography. Um, all these biographies are very, very distinctive. Um, they're very fascinating, creative works of art in their own right. Um, and I feel very privileged that we managed to have all the three uh, authors together here um, on a platform this evening, um, perpetuating um, the very rich uh, legacy of uh, writing by women. Um, and obviously, it's an amazing extra bonus that we've had Juliet Stevenson with us, um, who 
being able to give a variety of different readings in different voices from different eras and make them all sound exactly as though they were what the original author would have intended. Uh, and on top of it all, um, Juliet had a very large part in sort of organizing and orchestrating the, uh, the, you know, the way the, uh, the, the evening ran. Um, so I'd like to thank all, th all, four, right, uh, all four speakers on the platform this evening. Thank you.